put out a few films recently about spiritual emergency. I think we had you in one of them. And it seemed to resonate a lot with the audience. And it feels like there's a lot of people who are interested in this and a lot of people who are finding this, the concept, useful. And I think it's particularly useful for right now because there's a lot of intensity. And I, I think the concept of spiritual emergency is all about intensity. It's a different way of looking at certain experiences, difficult experiences, and looking at them in, through a new frame. So, and I think you're probably uniquely placed to talk about this because you have such a long history in traditional psychiatry and then also a real interest in these altered states and then the spiritual emergency process itself. So I'd love if you could sort of give a little, uh, just a sort of potted history of your background and this, what, and maybe just what is a spiritual emergency and why do you think it's important to understand? I, I knew from when I was a medical student that psychiatry is what I wanted to do, something about the, the, the complexity and interest of working with people. And I suppose what struck me first about psychiatry was that for some people the drugs really work. Um, so there were some people who um, were, were incapacitated by their difficult experiences and sometimes the medication sorts, sorts them out beautifully. Um, and, but then I also learned very quickly that there were an awful lot of people for whom the, the drugs not only did not work, but they were problematic and they, 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 they were irrelevant. So then the challenge was how, how to work with those people. So that, that, so that drew me towards the psychotherapy training. So I, I, I did a training in analytical psychotherapy and I, I trained uh, as a group analyst. And then I became a consultant at, at, at the Royal London Hospital. Um, and according to the paradigms of the time, I, I would have been considered to be fully trained at that time. So I would have done my psychiatry training. Uh, I would have learned everything that there was to know about you know, the current state of psychiatry. I'd done my psychoanalytical training. So I, I was supposed to be done, but I, I knew that I wasn't. That triggered um, a, a search for me. Um, and eventually that led me to the work of Stanislav Grof, um, who was a psychiatrist. I would consider him to be the equal of, of Jung. In, 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 in many ways. He was, he was the original LSD psychotherapist when uh, LSD clinical research was the cutting edge of psychiatry in the 50s and 60s. Um, and that when that became impossible because of the, the war on drugs, he and his wife developed a method called, called holotropic breathwork. Um, um, and he'd also written a lot about the, the deep psyche and I think he expanded on some of Jung's ideas and developed some, some unusual and original and helpful ideas for himself. Um, so I find myself going to one of, one of Groff's um, holotropic breathwork modules. And of course, you know, he was, he was teaching. Um, the, the other teacher involved was Jack Cornfield, who was a Buddhist teacher. So it was a very kind of powerful mix of transpersonal psychology, of, of Buddhism, of, 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 of meditation and holotropic breathwork. And my, my own first personal experience of holotropic breath work um, was basically one of one of those big spiritual openings that proved to me, uh, you know, it's never going to prove it to anyone else, but it proved to me um, that the essential, that there's something um, that is true of value and useful um, um, and which is pretty fundamental to human experience that lies behind the great spiritual teachings. And it felt so I had a, a, a taste of that, that, that was, that was paradigm changing. Um, and so, of course, that led to, you know, um, after a big opening like that, that, that leads to some, some subtle changes in how you approach life. It also causes some, some vulnerability while you're moving away from one way of being in the world towards another way of being in the world. Um, and so that led me to, through the holotropic breathwork, training with, with Groff. Um, and, you know, which is rich and full. And one of the things that I, I learned with that was that it's all very well having a big spiritual opening, but actually that's only the beginning of the work. Um, and in the deep psyche, we all have, we, we all have our kind of lesions, our difficulties, our, our, our traumas. Uh, over which we erect our, our psychological defences. So as you go into the deep psyche, um, as some of the, as you start moving through some of those formative ego structures, it exposes some some of, some of those formative wounds. And and that I think is is, is the work. 
So one of the things I learned with that um, is that it's a process that takes time. Uh, so in holotropic breathwork training, I think a lot of us found um, that, that, that moving through this, this more difficult territory, which is very mysterious and hidden, will, 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 will often take a few years. Um, so for me, I, I did the training for five years. You know, that's not to say that everything is sorted after five years. The term holotropic means moving towards wholeness. So the, the assumption is, is that you know, you, you, you're always working on something. So that really taught me about aspects of the deep psyche that I, I, I didn't, um, that hadn't been, hadn't been taught to me, hadn't been revealed to me in my psychoanalytic training. And the implication of that is, I think, in, um, in many uh, of those conditions that we might call psychiatric disorders, um, periods of intense psychological difficulty, um, these profound meaning states, um, I, I think essentially that's the, ter- that's the territory that people often find themselves navigating. These, these, um, these periods of, the, these aspects of a deep psyche, you know, the, the formative lesions, the early wounds, um, which are pre-verbal, they lie beyond narrative. Um, you, can't, you can't put a story to it, you can't express it. Um, they're, they're often very hidden behind our ego structures. Um, so that, so that was very interesting for me. And I think the other, the, the other contribution that, that Groff made was that the areas of deep psyche as revealed by the psychedelic experience, the holotropic breathwork experience, are exactly the same as the areas of deep psyche that are revealed by the psychiatric experience. Um, but of course, in a, psych, in a well-held psychedelic journey, well-held expanded state, there's a neat um, ascent um, you have um, you have the right mindset of in, of inquiry. Um, you're well held. You have you have good ground crew. It's not a matter of shooting rockets off into space. Um, and then you're you're helped through the integrative processes to make sense of it afterwards. Whereas in psychological crisis, you, you don't really have any of those advantages. Um, often the opening takes you by surprise. You have no theoretical framework. Um, your your setting, your social structures might be very fragile. Uh, they might be very unsupportive. And you're talking about spiritual emergency, which was something that Stan Groff probably coined the term for. Could you describe what a spiritual emergency is or what it might feel like to go through one? Because you're, you're kind of hinting at it, but maybe how it maybe feels from the inside. So the, the, the term spiritual emergency is, is, inherent, is inherently problematic. Um, I think because of the use of the term spiritual. So if you come from a spiritual context, um, um, if, you, if you start having difficult psychological experiences on a meditation retreat, then it will be seen very much as a spiritual emergency. Um, if you come from outside a spiritual framework, then often that sort of language doesn't really make any sense. It just feels very difficult. Um, it will feel confusing. Um, it will feel like a crisis. Um, and you know, I think we can use. And then there's an issue about what what, what sort of words you're going to use. Are you going to use a word like symptom? Well, symptom is a very medical term. It means there's something wrong with you. Um, you're going to use a term like emergent phenomena. Well, that that might that might be more helpful because it's something. You know, we're talking about um, we're talking about stuff that is emerging from your psyche, um, and that there is something that might be worked with in a useful way. Um, so if you go to, you know, if you go to traditional psychiatry, um, psychiatry will look at you through the lens of understanding um, your experiences in terms of a, a syndrome. Um, so if you do a psychiatric training, you're taught to recognise certain symptom profiles, and you're more likely to fit those symptom profiles in, 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 into the clusters you've been taught. And at its most fundamentalist, you, you've got the, the DSM and ICD-10 diagnostic categories. So you're seeing people very much as collection of symptoms, um, and then you, you might think of what biological treatment you're, you're going to give to them. Um, if you see it more as emergent, as, as something emergent, then you will think, well, how is this, how is this useful for growth? Um, what does this show us about what, what needs to be worked on? How, how can we support you? through a growth journey. I'm not the doctor telling you what is wrong with you. 
Um, at its worst, I'm not the doctor telling you that you are ill and you're going to be ill for the rest of your life, uh, which is what a lot of people hear. Um, you're taking more of the approach of how, how can we embark on a healing journey together um, so you can really get something out of it. If you prefer not to use the term spiritual emergency, like what, what does it mean? I, I know sort of archetypal stuff might come up. People might feel overwhelmed by by the meaningfulness of what's going on. How does it show up in people's lives for people to sort of recognize it as a, as a phenomenon? Well, I, I suppose the, the, most, the most useful for, for time is, is, is crisis. Um, and then there are all sorts of, there are all sorts of different forms of, of crisis. Um, and I think the term archetypal crisis is sometimes useful because it captures an increased intensity of meaning. Um, and often people will, um, often people will feel overwhelmed by the intensity of meaning, uh, and sometimes it will have a particular flavour. Like you know, might might have a paranoid quality. It might feel that that uh, you, you're in great danger. You might feel what we might term annihilatory anxiety. There might be some very visceral feeling that your existence is under threat. Um, if that gets projected onto the external world, so you feel the external world is threatening you, then that, that, that's what we might call, call paranoia, um, you know, which is quite difficult to work with. Um, so if you see as someone um, who, who, who sees things in, in that way, uh, would be how can, we, how, can we, how can we move from this being all out there, an external process, to an internal process that we might that we that we might we, we 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 might be able to work with in a useful way, and often that's really difficult. Some people might not be able to do that at all. Um, I mean, in conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, people have an intensity of meaning about imminent catastrophe. Your sense of um, of the world being a benign um, place um, is 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 completely is completely changed and transformed. Um, in elated states, there might be a sense of, um, there might even be a sense of, of spiritual awakening, of universal love, of the immortality of the soul. Um, in, in certain extreme states, states, people might feel that they themselves are, are immortal and they might want to test out the, 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 the hypothesis of immortality by, by, by behaving in a dangerous way in traffic. Um, so that's something that you, you might see in psychiatry from, from time to time. Um, in, in, in less extreme forms, um, it feels as though there's not only intensity of, of meaning, um, that something of great um, portent is happening, but also your, your, ego, your ego structure is uh, a faltering. Um, so your very familiar ways of being in the world are becoming less certain, are falling apart in some way. Mm. Um, so is in some ways the could be seen as sort of the dissolution of one personality structure and potentially a moving to something else, but it feels like a sort of the, the, the ending of, it, it can feel like an ending. Yes, yes. And of course we're, we're very attached to our ego structures. So there's a part of us that, that, that might feel that we want to relinquish them and, and, and move on but there's another part of us that resists that. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of moving from the ego structures that were to the ego structures that, that, that need to be. And I, we've sort of just been sketching out the territory a little bit so far, um, and I'm kind of playing the, um, the, um, the journalist role, but I'm also really interested in this topic because it's something I've personally experienced and want to, little, to bring that in a little bit more, make it maybe a little bit more personal. Because um, I've had... I've had several, I've done a lot of sort of spiritual practice work, probably dating back to, I guess, psychedelics at, at university quite extensively, and then different kind of transformational work. And I've experienced what I would, what I've, what I've found helpful to look through the frame of, of spiritual emergency or spiritual crisis or spiritual breakthrough, where I've had really intense periods of um, heightened experience that have, have varied between feeling very blissful but also then flipped over to feeling quite paranoid to feeling like it's intensely intensely meaningful in a positive way and then intensely meaningful in a kind of negative way like this sort of almost like cosmic drama centered on myself 
and I've, I've looked into this quite a bit for, for different kind of potential documentary work. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of familiar with the phenomenology of, of, of it, the way that it feels as well, but also kind of how I've read a lot of experiences of people who've, who've gone through similar things. Um, and there's a few pieces, like threads, I'd like to pick up from this. But one of them is this sense that I feel like we're in a, in a time where we're in almost like the post-secular world already. Like this, this sense of like the religious, which was sort of put off in, in some kind of walled off and in, in very much by the materialist paradigm, um, is coming back into the world in a, in a very real way. Lots of things that look very religious and sort of religious fervor seems to be coming back in. And my sense is that we are going to be tested like this this awareness of spiritual emergency i think is going to be come even more like more and more important to understand because i think we are being pushed more and more into extremes of intensity covid being a perfect example of of people kind of yeah being pushed into real intense states um is your sense that this is becoming more do, do you do you agree with that do you sense that this is a, a this is quite this isn't just um this is becoming more than just a fringe or a niche interest and something that is more and more important for us to understand. I think we're going through a shift. Um, I, I personally don't see um, much in the way of a, of a spiritual opening at the moment. It feels to me that the archetypal weather system at this point in time is not, is not really about that. Um, I, I think, I think that, that may well follow. But it's more of a descent you, you, you used the word descent before, so I guess, um, but it can have that quality of intensity as well, which I think is what we're seeing at the moment. So maybe it's not, it doesn't feel like a sort of liberation or a, or a sort of spiritual opening, it feels more like a descent or a... Yeah, so I, I think the, um, the, the archetypal characteristics of a time we're living through at the moment, I mean, obviously in this year with uh, the coronavirus ep epidemic, it's to do with um, restriction, isolation, um, turbulence, um, encounter with death, um, and something about an opportunity to look at shadow. So, so what is shadow? Well, shadow is obviously mysterious because it's what it's what we don't see. Um, but we we need to look at we we need to look at those structures that we don't see in order to move on to the next phase. I guess. Uh, there's also the encounter with death, um, which has been very visceral and, and real. has 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 touched many has touched many people, um, and so often we're we're kind of insulated from death in the in the West. We don't like to think about our mortality. It's not something that you really have conversations about or, or think about. That one day we 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 will all die, and I guess this year we've all we, we've all moved forward a little bit in regard to that. And if we really know that we're going to die, we know that we're, we're mortal, then wh where else does our mind turn? You know, and I think, I think that's really interesting. And I guess we're in the early stages of, the, the early stages of that, both in individually and collectively. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to bring it back a little bit maybe to the personal, the individual, because my experience of these, these states is that there's been, as I, I talked about sort of um, kind of periods of real illumination. I've also had kind of experienced real periods of, of um, lostness and, and, and depression as well. And w in retrospect, there has been a pattern to it. Like there's been, a re there's been reasons why a lot of the time it's felt like there have been things that came up within my, within my personal history that needed to be integrated. That a lot of what came up in these moments of real illumination were positive, but also there were things that that were um, problematic or difficult that needed to be integrated. And that, in retrospect, that felt like a, there was meaning to it, but, pro but maybe only really in retrospect, I could really understand what it was, what that particular formative experience was that needed to be integrated. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in what your experience of those patterns are, like what comes up in these states and how do we deal with it? What's the... Are there, are there any sort of guiding principles, you think? So what, what helps you most at the time? Um, how, 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 how did you take care of yourself or what was your setting like? In retrospect, not trying to make sense too quickly. Yeah. 
I think is the key thing that I would urge people because I think it's very easy for us to put a narrative on what's going on. Um, whether that's a sort of positive thing of like I've I've got these unique gifts or whatever it might be, um, to um, yeah, my 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 life is ruined and, and things are over or whatever, whatever that like tr to to yeah to try and make sense of things too quickly or to try and attach a narrative to something that maybe uh, we're not c fully perceiving. Um, that would be the one of the main ones I think. And were, 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 were you functioning okay in the external world when you were going through all this, or was that quite difficult as as you found? Um, I don't think I had an experience quite as intense as the one that Jung talks about, because I know that he was pretty much incapacitated for um, many years. But also, what was what was very interesting in that was that the kind of visions that he seemed to be tr troubled by seemed to be like seemed to kind of prefigure the First World War in some way, yeah. that he was sort of maybe sort of connected up to the, the world psyche in a way that, that he found very difficult to, mm. to integrate, um, which is also, I think, partly a problem that comes in these, these opening experiences, which is what's mine and what's collective? Are we actually picking up stuff that's, our, that's personally ours or are we picking up stuff that's actually... Um, Kind of part of the collective psyche that when and things become quite difficult to differentiate, maybe. Well, I, I think you've hit the, the nail on the, on the head there. And I think what often happens in these periods of crisis is that um, as 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 you break open, if you like, you're you're accessing your your own inner world, your 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 own um, your, your your personal unconscious, and what lies in there with all its complexity and all the unprocessed emotions that go with that, often shame is, is, is a big one there. Um, but also as your ego structures break open, you know, you're, 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 you're opening yourself to the collective unconscious. Um, of course, the collective unconscious is not, um, is, is, is not part of the vocabulary of the medical and scientific establishment. But those who work in this territory uh, seem to find it a very useful concept. Um, there's, there's a certain transpersonal um, uh, territory about it. Um, and that's maybe why this period, like the coronavirus and this period, feels very, I, I, it feels tangible, like the sense of the collective consciousness because of this sort of singular event that we're all going through feels incredibly tangible right now and feels like it is something that... The, that Maybe a lot of people may be feeling intensely for the first time, which is what, what I think I was maybe hinting at as as the, the period that we're going through has this has this quality that is illuminated by this concept. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, a, it's such an interesting thing to think about um, that it's of, of a collective crisis also holds an opportunity and. What what is the nature of the, the tectonic plates of our collective unconscious that are that are, that are shifting, and um, you know we, we might see the task ahead that we we need to unite in in, in a way that is, is helpful to the survival of the, the species and, and the planet, um, but it also needs to be held. The, the setting the setting needs to be secure so we can do the integrative work that we need to do, and I guess that's where we are at the moment. You know, how can we um, how, how can we foster the right mindset? How, how can we think about how we can how we can come through this in a good way? How can we lean how can we lean into it with a spirit of, cu of curiosity? How, how can it be a healing crisis? One of the the reasons that I wanted to share a little bit more about my personal history is I've seen I've seen this this topic discussed every now and again. There was a film Crazy Wise that was that came out like a few years ago. Um, but whenever I see the case studies of people who've gone through these experiences, they seem to be in a like the, the guy in Crazy Wise was 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 really pretty down and out. He wasn't he wasn't doing well. He was he had these kind of experiences. That he found very difficult to integrate and was was in a in a pretty poor way. And I feel like it's more important for because um, in my experience they've they've been difficult, but they've actually made me much more 
Um, they've made me the person that I am, and I feel the sort of the inspirational quality that I've glimpsed in those in those moments has actually become more and more part of my life as I've been able to integrate it. And I actually wanted to, I wanted to sort of show that that it's, um, yeah, that there is there is a potentially more whole, more complete place on the other side of that. Uh, and I'm and and that for me is something that I don't think is enough. Yeah, I don't think it's reflected enough, or I don't see it reflected enough. But you, you're working really hard on your integration, and you know it seems that a lot of your adult life has 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 been an, an integrative journey, and you're, you're taking it really seriously. And I, I guess I, I'm I'm kind of the same. And here we are, and we're, we're talking about integration, and we're, we're we're trying to make sense of things. You know, our personal experiences, what what's going on around us, and it's it's hard work. And it, it takes a long, long time. Um, and uh, 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 for, for, for a lot of people, for whatever reason, it, it's a difficult journey. Um, so there's, there's a whole load of questions there about what, what more can be done to help people with this, this in, integrative journey. It's not a few weeks, it's not a few months, it's an, you know, it's an, it's, it's an ongoing process. Um, Which is the paradox of, um and again, we don't really have a better word than spirituality for it. I, I find it kind of a bit of a tired, played out word generally. But the the realization that it's it's not a panacea. That, that for example, you look at kind of the way that mindfulness or psychedelics are now being kind of introduced into the culture, and a lot of concerns that people have is that they're being used as palliatives, or they're being the, they're being put into a system where the idea is you take this pill, you feel better. Whereas what actually happens is you take this pill or you do this kind of meditation retreat, and what you may find is that you're actually starting to uncover stuff that you need to work on that you've never encountered before. And this kind of realization that it's a wholly different, it's a wholly different frame that we're bringing in with a lot of these practices and a lot of this, this knowledge. And I guess one of the things that I'm keen to do with with Rebel Wisdom, and I know you're keen to do with your work, is to kind of give people a little bit more guidance, a little bit more support, or a little bit more understanding of that process. Because in a way, once you start that, it's very difficult to go back. Um, We sort of turn up the the vol... I I look at it as almost like turning up the volume on our experience. You assume that people kind of maybe assume that a spiritual awakening, or it's sort of turning up the dial on just the good stuff. It's like, no, once you turn up the dial, you're turning up the dial on on absolutely everything, the whole, the whole kind of 360 degrees of, 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 of everything. So there was a, a German theologian called, called Rudolf Otto many years ago who introduced the term numinous, and he said very clearly, you know, and he, he, he said the, um, the, the sense of the sacred, that, that, that deeply felt feeling of sense of the sacred, which underlies all, all religious experience, um, has a, a light side and a dark side. Um, can have a beautiful, spiritual, joyful, ecstatic, cosmic union um, quality, or it can have a, a, a nightmarish, terrifying quality, which I suppose we capture when we see horror films. I mean, I don't see horror films, but, but, but I, I think that that's one of the draw of, of horror films, that it pulls you towards the numinous in, in some sort of way. And what was also found was that um, if... If people are supported through the, the more nightmarish aspects of numinous experience, then it, it kind of unfolds and something is um, some, something is released. But there's a natural process about it. Um, but of course, in real life, it's so much more difficult than that. It's much messier, much more complicated. Um, um, it, it, it's rarely a clean process uh, for people going through crisis. Um, in, in expanded state journeys, it, it, it often is that sort of process. Yeah, and the other part of that process often is that we become more uncomfortable with things that we were that we'd made peace with or we were comfortable with before, like certain friendships or certain situations in our lives that we were um, were suboptimal, but we were sort of making do. And suddenly, as we start to kind of go on that process. We realise that it's it, it's it's intolerable now. Like those little lies that we told to ourselves suddenly become intolerable, and that process, I think, is something that 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 all of this kind of work that we we talked about starts to unlock as well. Yeah. So if if change happens in a slow supported context, the, the adjustments that you, you mentioned are, 
uh, are, are much easier if if it, if it happens if it happens quite suddenly. If there's if there's a sudden opening, if there's a rapid opening, the changes happen much more quickly. Then it, then it's, it's a lot more disruptive. Mm. Um, and I wonder if you have any more thoughts or tips that you think are important for for people to know who maybe have had or are having experiences like this or know people who've had experiences like this? So the, the most important thing is safety. Um, so, so keep yourself safe. Um, find, find good people to be with. Um, make sure the environment is, is okay and tolerable because anyone who's going through this sort of experience feel, feels, feels thin-skinned if you feel vulnerable. Um, so, so somewhere, somewhere gentle, um, which is which is tolerable, so you can maybe even start to do the 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 the, the, the inner work, which is part of the process. Um, and it's so helpful to know that it is potentially a healing journey, and that the stuff which is coming out, you might call it symptoms, is not an expression of of disease, but it's an expression of material that that needs to be worked with. And I think that message of hope is is so fundamental. Um, um, and that so many people have, 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 have been through it before you, um, that it might feel shameful. Um, and, and often it does because, you know, you're not functioning so, so well. Um, but, 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 it has a, but it has a value. Um, and then it's important to find ways of getting through it. So what are the ways of getting through it? Well, the sort of tools that people find helpful are you know, physical activity, um, might be nature, gardening, mindfulness, um, using art as a method of integration, listening to music, um, journaling. Sometimes journaling. Yes. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about articulating our experience that seems to allow it to settle in our yeah. in our in our psyche. But, it, but it's so difficult because on one hand, you're 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 leaning into what's coming out. Um, and it's useful, and you want to make sense of it at some stage, even if at the moment it seems insensible. Uh, but at the same time, you 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 have to manage yourself. You have to manage yourself. So your defences are, are are opening, um, but at the same time, you you need those defences so you so you can get through the day. No, I mean the, the ideal environment would be an environment where you really are looked after, so you so you can go deeper into what it is that you're going. That you're going into, but these environments are very difficult to find. And what's the clash that, as, as someone who was in uh, traditional psychiatry for so many years, what's the clash that happens between this and the traditional kind of uh, model, which can often uh, misunderstand or mis misdiagnose situations like this? Well, so so when I first went into psychiatry, um, we, we we still had we still have the old asylums. And in some ways, the old asylums were quite nice places to go and have your crisis. Um, you know, you, 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 you could go there for a period of time. Um, psychiatrists in those days would, would watch and wait. So generally, they'd be quite hesitant about medication unless there was a very, unless there was a very clear indication for it. Um, so you could kind of have an old-fashioned breakdown in, in, a, in, a re, in a reasonable environment, you know, an old asylum with, with beautiful grounds. Uh, hopefully the staff would be kind to you because that's that's a crucial ingre ingredient um, and you, you could take your time um, and m most psychiatrists were not in a hurry to give you a diagnostic label they were not in a hurry to give you medication um, and um, you know ho hopefully you would emerge from that having had the, the, the rest and support you need uh, of course th those days are completely gone uh, you know in these days there's no you know, there's no sense of asylum if you go into hospital. Hospital wards are much more disturbed. Um, you know, they're not quiet places where you can do your your your, in, your integrative work. Um, you know, more recently, there's been a lot more um, pressure on psychiatrists in training to make diagnoses, to to give medication, um, which is supposed to be an evidence-based model. Um, a lot of the some of the evidence-based model was was wrong. So some of the uh, some of the things we were taught are, are wrong. Uh, so, for example, I, I was taught um, that if somebody's got psychotic symptoms, they need to take antipsychotics for, for two years, and hopefully they, they, they won't develop long-term schizophrenia. So we now know that long-term use of antipsychotics causes 
dopamine receptor supersensitivity, you know, which, which causes additional problems. So in our attempts to, to help, we were actually making, making things worse. I'm afraid psychiatry has got quite a history of that. Um, you know, the people given these treatments are generally really good people. You know, who've gone into the mental health profession because you know that, that's the way they, they want to make a difference. You know, they, they might have their own experience of members in their family with um, you know with psychological difficulties, which which adds to their vocation. Um, but it's, it's, it's such a difficult um, subject, and some of the tools that we we have have, have, have been very limited. Um, you know, in modern psychiatry, we, we are seeing more more crisis teams. We're seeing uh, we're seeing approaches like open dialogue, uh, which is which is a real step forward. Um, you know, which is an attempt to 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 figure out what is in the shadow. Um, you know, what's going on behind the scenes um, by by getting together the, the friends and family of the person, seeing seeing people very much as 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 as, as being part of a complex system of relationships rather than an, an individual. Because mm. there is a sort of perspective that the there's a fundamental sort of clash of um, paradigms here and the materialist model just doesn't understand, um, has no place for spirituality, has no place for the idea of spiritual emergency, therefore it, it, it always gets it wrong. Is that, uh, is that too much of a simplification, do you think? I, I, think, there is, I think there is a fundamental paradigm clash that um, is going to be difficult for some people. I think there is a way in which the paradigms can come together. As an example of a paradigm clash, these days if people, well, for, for many years now, if, uh, if people are going uh, feeling unhappy, they'll go to their GP, they'll be put on antidepressants. So that colludes with the notion that um, it's not your responsibility to work on problems. You know, um, that you, you, you're, you're ill, you have a condition, here's some medicine that will, will make it better. The paradigm that we're talking about is, is fundamentally, fundamentally different, um, that we do need to tolerate some discomfort, that the discomfort is, is useful, and it is, it, and it is our job to, to, work, to work on it. There's some stuff there that is useful um, and that, that we need to think about, which is, which is a fundamentally different paradigm. Now, in my experience, the vast majority of people would prefer to go for the first model. Um, that, you, you, that we, we don't really want to think about it. We just want to feel better. Um, that's how that's how most of us li 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 live our lives. Um, so it feels as though there's a huge, um, you know, there's, there's potentially a huge paradigm shift that that we all need to go that we all need to go through. Are, are we edging towards that paradigm shift? Well, we, it's possible that we might be. Um, that might be one of the f one of the fruits of the psychedelic research, for example. That in a way, it's it's training a whole new generation of of, of therapists, of of health workers, to to be with people in a in a different way. Um, that you're sitting with people, you're supporting people. You're not going to do the integrative work while people are in an expanded state, but you but you, you're going to you're going to do that work later. Um, so if you um, you know if you think forward to a time when there'll be more people with that paradigm working in mental health. You know, I think perhaps we, 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 we can feel a little more optimistic. I mean, one of the questions that comes up talking about this, and I think one of the reasons that it's quite difficult to talk about is, um, is, is there a clear dividing line between kind of spiritual emergency and uh, mental illness? Because some people obviously are, are on psychiatric drugs. Some people they, they work very well for. They're in really bad way if they come off their drugs. And you've got to be kind of mindful that you're not putting out a message just saying, well, actually all of this is just spiritual emergency and it's being misdiagnosed and uh, to make a sort of blanket comment like that. Yeah. So I, I think what we're moving towards is, 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 is moving away from labels. So in, in some ways, that, hopefully that question will, will, will lose its meaning because we'll be working with people and, 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 and what they bring us. Um, ha having said that, there, you know, I think anyone who works in psychiatry or mental health will know that there are some people um, whose constellation of symptoms would, 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 would fit the model of, say, bipolar disorder, or very occasionally, because it's a rare condition, um, what, what, what might be called schizophrenia. Um, but that's the extreme end of the spectrum, and the vast majority of people are just people. Um, who, who are having 
some experiences which I find you uncomfortable and difficult to deal with. And if you want to, if you see things through the lens of the diagnostic categories, you can find a way of fitting people into the diagnostic categories and e even prescribing a medication based on that diagnosis. Um, but that, that doesn't seem to be, um, that doesn't seem to be growth. Um, but but it is, it's often, it, it's often perceived as unhelpful. Um, there are many people attending psychiatric clinics who feel that the psychiatric model works for them, the medication works for them, helps keep them stable. Um, sometimes it maybe stops people from thinking about things that um, maybe they should be thinking about. Sometimes it gives, sometimes the medication gives people the stability that they need, so maybe they can do what they need to do, advance in life in whichever way. So it, it's, it's such a hugely complicated area. Um, that if anyone gives you a, a straight and simple answer, then um, you know, then then then, then, then often that's, that's not helpful. So we want to move away from from reductionism, from from more fundamentalist approaches. Rebel wisdom isn't only about the ideas in the films; it's also about how we bring them into our lives, which is why over the last few months we've invested in developing the Rebel Wisdom community our digital campfire. We've launched a new platform for discussion and connection, started regular meetups and practice sessions for members, plus Q&As with some of the amazing interviewees we've had on the channel, and our wisdom gym with some of the biggest names in growth and transformation. So if you'd like to support Rebel Wisdom to help us continue to make films and to find the others, maybe think about joining the Rebel Wisdom community. Thank you for watching.